Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 17th episode of your new favorite internet show, Vision Con Live. I'm your host, Zach Wilson, but you didn't come here to see me today. You came to see the woman of the hour. She's Pearl from SpongeBob, the boss from the Metal Gear Solid series, Diane Simmons from Family Guy, just to name a few. She is a absolute legend who is as indomitable as she is incomparable. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the one, the only, Lori. Alan, Lori, how you doing today? Oh my gosh, that was the best intro ever. Can you just do that for me every day? Just leave <laughs> a message, call me every morning, I'll wake up to that and be like, woohoo, woohoo, that was lovely. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Lori, I gotta be honest though. I, you have kind of rattled me in my sense of reality. Please let me explain. For years, I have been a huge fan of yours because of your work as the boss in Metal Gear. Metal Gear Solid being one of my favorite series of all time. But mm -hmm. so when I approached you, before I emailed you, I wanted to, you know, see a couple more of like your, of what you have done over the years. Cause you know, I didn't like to be genuine. I don't like to, you know, reach out to people that, you know, I'm not big fans of. Be creepy and weird, which you're so not. You're adorable. <laughs> that too. But then I look and I was like, hold up. Your pearl from SpongeBob and yeah. Dan Simmons from Family Guy. And yeah. I gotta be honest, I was looking at uh, behind the voice actors and I thought there was something wrong. So I busted out my PS3, you know, put in Metal Gear Solid HD collection to listen to the boss. Okay, that's a, that's a voice I'm very used to hearing. I then watched a couple episodes of SpongeBob and Pearl. Sounds nothing like the boss. Family Guy, you know, a show I watched a lot when I was a teenager. Diane Simmons, nothing like the boss. I don't know how you do it. We'll get to that in a minute. But the first question I want to ask you, Lori. Yes. How do we get here? You know, you are a very accomplished actor, one of the most well-known, both for your coaching and for you as a person. Was this the goal, you know, since day one? Or was this just yeah. something that led to a bunch of different steps? Pretty much. That's a great question. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, as voice actors, that's our job is to sound different mm -hmm. in all of our roles. And we're all a little bit sort of sensitive, empath, crazy people who listen and observe. And so you're like, oh, my God, that crazy gym teacher I had, you know, in fifth grade becomes like this character that'll land you a series or something like that. You know, one of my fabulous mentors and dear friends, Charlie Adler, always reminds me to take people that you know in your life or that you went to college with, relatives, whatever, and take some essence of that uh, that character, um, that person, the way they speak, the cadence, it could be somebody of the opposite sex, it doesn't matter, right? And then be able to kind of use that as one of your characters. And uh, to the beginning of the whole thing, uh, my parents are artists, they're voice artists as well, and singers and directors and producers. And so they met at theater school and they were, uh, they went to American University, a great school. They were theater majors with radio minors. And um, they, uh, my mom and dad both went into acting at Arena Stage, and then my dad opened an ad agency and wrote commercials. Ad agency, I sound like I've been drinking. It's just the, it's just Corona. <laughs> I'm a little crazy. Anyway, so dad went into jingle writing and voiceover, and so you like Diane Simmons. It's really based on my mom because she was doing a lot of news anchor stuff, you know, in real time. Like back in the day, they didn't have home studios in a booth when they would get breaking news, and so she would go down there and do the daily reporting for I think it was Channel Nine in the DC area where I'm from. So I think if I had come home and said, mom, dad, I wanna be a lawyer or doctor, they would have been like, what? That's ridiculous. You need tap dancing and, and you know, juggling as a backup. So I couldn't have come from a more creative environment. <laughs> my sister's a DJ, my brother's an amazing musician. So it kind of runs in the family. So that's, I'm so, so grateful for that. I was always encouraged to go for my dreams and that still to this day, I get lots of pep talks and you can do it. So yeah. So you think just showbiz was just kind of in your DNA from day one? Yeah, and I remember being in third grade, fourth grade, uh, and doing like three blind mice for some recital or whatever. And I'm not especially tall at all, but then I was like just like four inches, five inches taller than all the other girls. So I got to play the mom and boss them around. And I was like, this is cool. You know, I get to play like this lady who does this and this. And then I remember having, you know, I've had this low voice. I finally, in the age that I've sounded like my whole life, all the women in my family are like, hello, hello. We used to mess with like my aunts and their various boyfriends calling the house. And they'd be like, damn it, who is this on the phone? But um, yeah, my choral teacher, Mrs. Baldwin, who I adore and owe everything to, she was like, you know what? You have a low voice. Why don't you go sit in the tenor section? I was like, okay, because that's what the cute boys were. And um, she said, you know, why don't you listen to... 
uh, Bette Midler. You know, she's got an interesting voice and she encouraged me to learn and sing the rose. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't, honestly, truly, I wouldn't be doing what I, you know, I wouldn't be singing, talking for a living. So, yeah. What do you think your first like big role was? I mean, obviously throughout the years, you know, you've had a plethora of them, but what did you think would consider in your own opinion, your like big breakout role? Um, that's a great question. I know when I first moved here and Chris Zimmerman, who I owe my life to, Chris Zimmerman Salter, um, I remember thinking, coming from New York, I was like, I'm hysterical. I've been doing the Groundlings in New York. I'll be a shoe in for animation. And I've been doing commercials and stuff for my dad and for other people since I was a kid. So I kind of had that market down. And I was like, well, just because I'm funny doesn't mean I don't need training. Like, that drives me crazy when people are like, I have a great voice. I'm a shoe in for voiceovers. And while that's true, you have to have talent. You have to study. You have to know how to have some script analysis. You know, you have to know what's happening in the scene and, and all that stuff. Um, but so Chris was wonderful and I did kind of like a pre-family guy thing with Seth MacFarlane when he first got out of Rhode Island School of Design. And so it was called Larry and Steve and I played this like lady who had sold a talking mat a mattress to the talking uh, dog. And so that was sort of like a really cool thing. And then she cast me in SWAT Cats and that was so awesomely intimidating and amazing. I got like on the job training because it was Jim Cummings and Mark Hamill and Gary Owens. I played his niece and Candy Milo and Charlie Adler and I know I'm missing someone. So that was amazing uh, for Hanna-Barbera when Hanna-Barbera existed, which is amazing. And then Fantastic Four, maybe in 1994, might have been the breakthrough thing with my dear, dear friend and one of the loves of my life, Quentin Flynn and Bo Weaver and Chuck McCann. So we got to do that in 1994. And that was, a, that was the coolest thing ever. Um, and then a couple years later, I booked Family Guy and SpongeBob in the same year, which was just an anomaly. I mean, I talent yeah there's some talent that goes along with that but it's just extraordinary luck and i'm so grateful for the blessings that have come my way for sure well you say that you know you know talent but a lot of luck which i'm sure there's some truth to that but i wouldn't underscore your talent because you brought up two great points that i wanted to make so diane simmons you know you can definitely hear a lot of diane simmons in your natural voice <laughs> however i would also argue so if here's, you know, on the spectrum, here's Diane Simmons, you know, maybe here somewhere is the boss, some of your other characters, and then Pearl is, you know. They're all, so, well, Pearl is very much a part of me. <laughs> I probably couldn't have through like, that. But right, well, Pearl's like a big, crazy teenager. And, oh, absolutely. And, but like her voice is so different than all of the other voices that you, they, like, you know, like I threw over there. I mean, that's kind of where Pearl's register is. So kind of how do you sculpt a voice like all of these different voices that are yeah. so different from one another, yet still cultivated into their own individual beings. Well, it's our job again as voice actors to fill in the imagination of uh, and come to and bring to life whatever the writer has has created. And once a sh once a script comes to a voice actor, where there's hopefully. Um, uh, not only a character description, a breakdown, a spec, but hopefully you get to see what the character looks like, right? And if you don't, that's where your imagination comes in. That's where you fill in all the blanks and you think about what their childhood was like. Who do they talk to? Who do they hang out with? Um, is she an alien? Is she, does she have braces? I mean, all sorts of crazy things, you know? And so that's what's so fun about my job. And I remember this is actually, pardon my uh, boobs, right? And the thing. I remember when I saw this and my breakdown, for my audition and she was you know this i forget exactly what the spec was but it was um hold on finn i'm letting my dog hold on to that so you know i knew she was this teenager and she was kind of a bratty but lovable daddy's girl so it was like it's kind of a california thing and then i knew she had to be really big because she was that she's the biggest animal in bikini bottom so i just kind of added this big thing to her voice but kept that sort of like girly i love them all my dad's cheap but i'm still a daddy's girl and then out she came and then you know added a laugh and that seemed to stick over the past 20 years and we're still going strong. So going yeah, strong. daddy. So I just knew her voice was big and large. And like I said, the boss, it's just me when I'm pissed. The <laughs> when I'm pissed and like when I want to take out the current administration and things like that, I just kind of tapped into that, to that. There was ever anyone that we would call for that. I mean, that would definitely the boss. If she could run for president, uh, uh, I would love to, yeah, I wish I could reincarnate myself into her in person. I, I really do, I, that's, that's my wish. Well, I would definitely vote for you because not only are you a very accomplished voice actress, actor, entertainer, you're also a great person, as well as an animal activist and very own vegan, which is something I kind of want to talk about because I've you know, tried in the past, you know, 
to go vegan, you know, to kind of take a more active approach, you know, to help these animals. However, you know, I, I've, I personally have kind of had, you know, trouble sticking to it. So kind of yeah. what's your secret with, you know, sticking to vegan? And you want to talk a little bit about your animal activism? Um, I just try to, I try to support a lot of amazing organizations and people. One of my best friends is Fia Pereira, and she has saved a bajillion um, uh, goats and horses and piggies. And I might text her actually while we're speaking to find out because uh, to make sure I understand her um, her uh, charity. I have some dear friends at Animal Help and Wellness. How, how I first got into animal activism was I was going through a terrible breakup. And I knew that the best way to sort of get yourself and oneself out of that kind of grief and just sort of shock and sadness um, was to go be of service. So my dear friend Fia said, you know, I've been following her day job. She, she's an amazing writer, a uh, screenwriter, and we wrote a pilot together called Do the Voice. Her day job, if you will, was working for the Humane Society trying to stop the SEAL Club camp, you know, campaign where they do that to them, which is horrible. So she said, I've been following this uh, U.S. No to Dog Meat or U.K. No to Dog Meat. And so we sort of took some of their posters, which they encouraged, and we put on a protest outside the Hollywood Bowl. And it was a very quiet, peaceful protest, and we had some... Um, I said, let's get some of the, the writing in Chinese so that, and all, and the Americans were like, I don't eat dogs, but the Chinese people were crying because what happens over there is there's stolen dogs, dogs bred just for, for human consumption, and they're, sorry to say this, but they're, you know, they're tortured um, in every imaginable way that you could imagine uh, before they are consumed, because they, before they're killed, while they're alive, skinning, cutting off their paws, you name it, because they believe that the meat is sweeter the more the animal has endured that kind of adrenaline and pain and that it has more healing properties let's say or it cools them down like in uh, Korea they have the Baknal festival in um, in China there's the Yulin dog festival uh, clearly not a festival so that's how I entered into that and I just try to support a lot of groups as much as I can Wufa might have some lovely ladies that start that women united for animal welfare and uh, animal hope and wellness and I have so many different individuals and I will post them all over my my page so that everybody can see and my friend Fia who um, you can probably find her global activista on Instagram and she and she her Facebook page is public Fia F-I-A Pereira P-E-R-E-R-A and then I work a lot with Jane Velez Mitchell of Jane Unchained and that's amazing and I work a lot with Mercy for Animals um, and also my dear friend um, Alam who puts on National Animal Rights Day and so we do that every year and it's, it's really about, I mean, I always had to sort of like watch cholesterol just because my dad's history, you know, everybody's got something in their family, like dimples, like cholesterol, like cellulite, like yeah. repeating gums, I don't know, you know what I mean? And so I've always had to watch that. And then like dairy just never did it, did it agreed for me. I've had a terrible wheat allergy since I was a kid, like just couldn't eat it. My mom was like, Bleh. that's what your childhood was like. <laughs> so I was used to taking stuff out of my diet. And when we started this, we started to carry on with the, um, the the U.S. no to dog meat um, and stay in that that sort of world. Um, someone lovingly said to me, "You might just want to watch these two videos. You know, if you're going to do an animal organization and sort of be a voice for the voiceless." And I was like, oh, "I don't need to watch any. Yeah. I just, I, you know, I just put my dog. I wouldn't eat my dog, and I put that next to, especially cows and pigs. You're just like they are smarter than dogs. They get their young taken away from them so very quickly, and so it's really." It's it's a it's a it's something it's a change that all of a sudden I didn't realize that I was actually really ready for, and um, and it's just you know meatless Mondays like just you know tr and it's also like our bodies produce cholesterol and you're probably young you don't have to worry about it but you'd be surprised right so the less crap that we put in our bodies we keep our immune system up like during a time like this you know and basically right before any animal dies when they say humane slaughter. Well, that doesn't quite go together, does it, yeah, right? No, so <laughs> it's just one day at a time. Like, are you adding in more tofu? Like the Beyond Meat burgers, the Impossible burgers, beans, nuts. Like last night I made like spinach, a baked potato, and I put a, like, I bun um, put a bunch of tomatoes, cucumbers, and like cashews. There's uh, nuts. There's a bajillion ways you can get your calories. I mean, clearly I'm not a skinny, tiny little thing. Um, so, you know, there's, there's great ways to not eat death and torture and still be very healthy. And now I'll get off my bandwagon, but it's really about looking up recipes and, and saying like, okay, so in the morning, like oatmeal with flax and berries and nuts and you're full and you've had a ton of protein. And then, you know, so it's just, it's just, um, looking into new things and realizing like, how do I feel? This makes me feel different. I have tons more energy. Um, edamame, like you'd be so surprised what food has protein, broccoli, spinach, 
Spinach has so much protein, so does broccoli. Because everyone goes, where do you get your protein from? Vegetables have plenty of protein, so does quinoa. So there you go. Well, and I mean, you jumped on the off the bandwagon now, but I'm going to jump back on it because yeah. first, off, first off, I didn't expect to become like, you know, a more well, better, well-rounded person after this interview. So I appreciate you for that. But I also wanted to talk about, because, you know, I was doing research like I do on all of these guests, and I found a story on your website that truly touched me and, you know, made me tear up, which admittedly isn't that hard to do. But uh, the, story about, the story about how you rescued your own dog. Mm. Well, it was during that time that I'm going to start to cry. It was during that same time and my dog, Harry, I've, I've always grown up with big dogs. St. Bernard's, my aunt had mastiffs. I love big dogs. And my, um, my big dog, Harry, uh, had lost his, I went through a, a bad breakup. I lost my one boy, Frankie, to cancer from diagnosis to death was like less than two weeks. And so it was just me and big Harry. He was part Newfie, part Chow. And, um, you know, hip stuff as they get older, especially if he did something called degenerative myelopathy. So he walked like a drunken sailor and he would drag his feet and I'd have to, you know, really, you know, tend to his knuckles and everything. But he was totally still very present and happy and eating and wasn't making any accidents in the house. But then all of a sudden he just took this like slight turn. I was like, nope, I'm not giving him one second of not having his dignity, not one second. And I remember I was get, doing an interview for Inside Out. They were doing some, uh, pic, like CNN was doing some Pixar interviews on all of us. And um, I, I was like, I was so distraught about Harry that I stopped at a gas station. I was like, shit, I better put like at least five bucks of gas in the car, which in California, you always leave a full tank of gas in case there's a mass exodus and you have to leave, right? So I always have a full tank of gas. I get, put my five bucks in the car and I'm like, who the hell, what is that? This like, hi, 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 just cute tail wagging little, little bushy bush. And he's like pure breed Bichon and they were just treating him like shit at the gas station. I think he was kind of hovering. So he may have been someone's dog that was dropped off there, but I just sort of picked him up and I saw that he had like no hair. I'm gonna go pick him up and show him to you. No hair from, you know, his hair, I mean his chin rather, down to like his feet. And he had black sooty feet. And I just picked him up and I dropped him off at my old vet. He came home and Harry kind of gave me, it was a sign. It was the first time he couldn't get outside by himself. And I said, okay. So I said, you know what, honey, I don't know if you know what's wrong, but the, cause the, it's not, you can't feel the nerve thing, Harry. I said to him. And so then I, we sent him over the rainbow bridge that night. And then, um, I sort of got a message from Harry that he was like, I want you to go get that little white guy, that little white doggy. And I did this hippy dippy spiritual reading and the girl was like, why do I keep seeing a white dog? She goes, uh, "Never mind, sorry. It's about Harry. Hold on a second. The white dog is there again. She goes, Harry wants you to go get him. And I had SpongeBob the next day and we record two to six. And this woman said to me, you're going to go get Bumble. That's what I named him. My friend Tracy, a makeup artist friend of mine, because he had crazy hair, looked like the indomitable snowman. She's like, he can't be named Phil, which I named him after the really hot vet tech that got him back in shape and looking good. So I was like, all right, so he'll be Philip Bumble. So, um, so at about 4.25, I'm sitting there kind of panting in the booth. <laughs> and then our director, I don't think Tom Kenny was directing at the time. And somebody was like, uh, Lori's got like one pickup line or two lines at the end. Let's record them and get, I walked out of Nickelodeon at 4.30. I went right to where I had boarded Bumble and I brought him home. So there was not a day. They crossed over by like two days, but there wasn't a day, not, not even one night where there wasn't a baby in the house. My first little dog, and then I just rescued a new guy um, before from Barkin' Bitches. They're a great uh, rescue, phenomenal, because um, I wanted Bumble to have a buddy. They're tolerating each other uh, right before the pandemic. So um, you wanted to see Bumble, did you say, Zach? I absolutely did. Well, duh, hold on. Oh, and ladies and gentlemen, this is so exciting. Now's a great time to rescue Bumble. Come say hi. And then Spaniel, come say hi, too. But now's a really good time to rescue because everybody's quarantined and so a lot of people can't be at the shelters and so hi hi zach hi uncle zach hi. Oh, my God. he's so precious look at he's that so face he looks so sweet but he can be a little devilish and run around he can be kind of moody but he did my baby sure. my baby look at this baby so cute he just had a bath that's all the issue because there was a raccoon that decided to take uh residence under my patio oh then, this is the new doggy from bark and bitches he's so cute this is a new guy ah! hi uncle zach can i have a kiss give me kisses he's oh. like i'm on camera i'm very nervous anyway 
So adopt, don't shop. When people tell me they buy dogs, I want to, I start to not be able to breathe correctly. It's, you know, because thousands of, of dogs and cats are killed every day. So our LA animal shelter system isn't the best. So we have some work to do there legislatively, you know? Yeah, yeah, to be fair. And if you guys are watching right now live on Facebook, we've got a bunch of links already in the live chat. However, if you're watching this later on YouTube, we've got all those links as well as a bunch hey. of other links of where okay. you can go to adopt and don't shop. That's now, exactly right. And you know, to go to the high kill shelters, I think people get a little squirrely because they're like, I don't know what this dog is like, you know, and they're in the most stressful situation at a shelter. You can't even imagine. So take some time, go sit outside in the area, wear your mask, have your gloves on and to keep your distance and go sit with the dog and, you know, see if they know any commands. They, you know, see if they uh, are dog aggressive as you walk them by the other cages on your way to just kind of sit and hang and spend some time and really go with your gut. And then, you know, there's also so many phenomenal rescues. Um, Pickle Pants Rescue, which is a dear friend of mine, Karen, and she named it after um, my dogs, Harry and Frankie. May they rest in peace. And they're a wonderful organization as well. And I think it's important to, um, to, 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 to go to a rescue as well, because if that makes you feel better that they are a little bit vetted, but there's still gonna be a different dog when you bring them home. You know, when it's always an opportunity to, to give love, to share love. I mean, we need them just as much as they need us, but we really need them. They teach us a lot of unconditional love, especially during this time and, and patience. For me, it's about patience, you know, and getting them to get used to each other and, you know, things like that. Of course, of course. And like, you know, yes, they're only a small part of our lives, but we are their entire lives. And so yeah. I can only imagine, you know, how rescuing, you know, an animal who just desperately need someone you know how fulfilling that will be so again guys you know link down below if you're watching this later on youtube but the next thing i want to talk about Lori, not only you know if i stopped right there you're already a supremely talented entertainer you know rescuer uh, and animal advocate but i'm going to add another thing on the list you're also a vo coach a mentor to hundreds you know how do we get into that um I, I'm, uh, uh, hold on, because uh, I like to be bossy. Okay. No, I'm, just, um, I'm, uh, I'm texting my friend Fia. I'm saying, what is, what is your rescue that I should promote live right now? Absolutely. Um, yay. Um, so anyway, thank you for asking about that. You know what it is? Um, again, goes back to Charlie Adler. I was making my animation demo. I wrote it. I had all these crazy people talking and calling into QVC. You can tell how old I am. And I kept it the same because now it, just, it seems like a retro uh, demo. And so, um, so I remember I recorded it with the lovely John Mitchell, who's a casting guy and he does demos now and teaches to this day. I met him through the lovely Elaine Craig casting. They're just a lovely bunch of folks there. And I said, I said, can I bring, can I bring Charlie Adler in? And Charlie's like my energy times like a thousand. And so he was like, faster, louder, funny. If you're going to do Liza Minnelli, she needs to be really drunk. So I was like, okay, so it's Liza, <laughs> you know? And, you know, like I had been on cow and chicken and I did this voice. I was kind of like pre Pearl. And so with Charlie and John Mitchell said, sure, bring Charlie in. So that turned into something that I did. I started coaching and then I was like, um, I just started doing demos. I love to see when people can connect with their and find their true self. And they're not just focused on finding a funny voice that they're actually acting and they're being in the scene and they're creating the world. And who are you talking to? And it's just like live action. A mic just happens to be there. What just happened? What are the stakes? What do you want from the scene? What do you want from the character? What's your point of view about it? Um, and it gives me, it's like, it's like instant gratification. And I'm like, yes. So I just, I really enjoy it. I love it. I love it. I absolutely love it. I, I teach a lot of classes with the lovely um, Marilyn Wisner from time to time and Susan Palio, my good, good friend, who's a wonderful teacher and engineer and a demo producer at Voice Tracks West. So we teach and coach a lot together. And then, well, I was making a list actually last night. We must have done like in the past several years, at least like 30 demos or so. So we have a really good time doing that animation and commercials. So and with the real read seeping into commercials so much, I was like, so for a voice of a person like mine, anybody over the age of 40, we grew up with like on sale now or introducing the all new, you know, so how do, how do we go with the trend of making that real read sound real and that it's still coming from a place of like, you actually care about the product. So I sort of managed to figure out how I do that. Uh, and I just wanted to share that with other people. And so I just, I really do. And my mom's a director and so is my dad. So that just kind of comes out naturally. And, and I, I just really enjoy it. 
Well, that actually perfectly transitions my way to my last two questions before we go into the plug zone. Now, a lot of people that have watched that watched this show since we've been doing a series on voice actors, uh, you know, all of them are big fans of the guests, but they also are people who are interested in getting into voice acting or are already in it, but just want to know how to be the next Lori Allen. So what would you, my first question, and these two questions I try to ask all of my guests, how do you personally deal with rejection? You know, rejection, like I always say, you know, is a big part of just life in general. However, in your industry, I would argue it is more prevalent than compared to other industries. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have some scripts to record today. I wish I could show you, but I can't. They're on my desk because the drawings are so fun. The drawings, you know, rejection, part, part of my job as an actor is to stay emotionally, physically, like spiritually fit and audition and still like I, I'm doing an on camera acting class that's kicking my butt. I have it on Monday and I'm like, Bleh, like I get nervous before I, you're always a student, right? So if I'm always a student and, I'm, and my job is to stay fit, stay, you know, vocally fit, like I talk a lot about vocal hygiene when I coach and everything like that. So, because I had nodes, it's not fun. I'm not a great screamer. Um, I'm a good screamer, but I'm not a great screamer because I had one little node. And so every time it sort of presses up against. And so I was like, okay, I'll do stuff that's less screamy. But the, in terms of the, the rejection stuff, our job is to audition every day. If you don't get the job, like that's, the, that's my job. If you get the job, that's icing on the cake. And it's like, I feel like you set yourself up for failure if you're like, if I lose weight, I'm gonna be happy. If I get this job, that means I'm successful. If I can own a home, that definitely means I'm like on the right track and I'm definitely an adult. It's like, it's just part of the job. So you gotta to wanna to do it so bad and you gotta have a minute to lick your wounds and be like, shit, I really wanted that one. You know, and it's just not personal. And those of us who are sensitive, creative people like yourself, it can be really, really challenging. And so, you know, stay in service, go check on other people, have a full life so that this doesn't become the sole focus of like, this equals, you know, voiceover or a booking equals who I am. Because then we're just, that's just setting yourself up again for failure and depression and anxiety, which a lot of us, you know, a lot of us creative folks, you know, um, have to mind that and have to, you know, work against uh, again you know, work to just stay happy and have a full big life so that that doesn't mean everything to you and define who you are yeah and sometimes it really does suck and you're like damn it i wanted that one i was talking to my dear my animation agent today i'm like what's going on with the blah 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 she's like i can't say you know so um yeah it's a lot of just being patient and having some faith yeah <laughs> well you know and you know a lot of people are watching and you know want to be voice actors so let's pretend for a minute i am the physical embodiment of everybody watching either right now live on facebook or later on youtube what advice would you give everybody watching I can tell you improv take an improv class online second city has classes online the groundlings has classes online you got to be fast on your feet because if you're in the session and you get direction and it's like can you can she just scott park and my dear friend always if we talk about funny uh, if you were to get just ridiculous uh, direction, like, can she just sound like she just hung up a picture? Can she just sound like she just installed a refrigerator? Sure, no problem. You gotta be able to just take weird direction and you gotta sustain your character and you gotta be able to identify stuff quickly so when you're auditioning and snapping a lot, like I just did, um, that you are able to make big, strong choices. Plus, when you're on a show, you'll get those additional characters to read. Can you be this, like, sort of, you know, Midwestern lady at the mall? Oh, yeah. Sure, of, of course I can. So if you're doing Pearl or something like that, you know, something, you're going to have another, can you be, like, a teenager with braces? Sure. So improv really helps to be able to get to the nitty-gritty and be able to get to those characters fast and funny and make big, bold choices. Um, I also really recommend, again, your instrument is so important. And when you're doing crazy voices, sometimes you don't realize how... Um, how hard your little vocal cords are working. So I say take one voice lesson so you have a nice warm up and a nice warm down and take care of your voice. Uh, improv class and take a good acting class because it's all voice acting. Again, who are you talking to? What do you want in the scene? And so often, I wish I could show you the script I'm looking at, but I can't. They're one-offs. So when you see your sides and they're one-offs, each one is almost like it's mini audition and each line has a little life of its own. So to really take an acting class, take an improv class, take a voice class to just actually keep your instrument. And it's, 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 you know, it's intense now on Zoom. You're sort of like looking at a bunch of people you don't know sometimes, you know, if you're taking class, but it's so important to be able to be quick on your feet and have the skill and check out the coaches that you want to work with, some like myself. And there's something great called the voiceover resource guide the voiceover resource guide it used to be a book back in my day it was an actual <laughs> pamphlet now it's online zach it's wonderful 
and you can look up just about anything and everything you need about demos and production and and who to take class with and you know and you can ask a lot of questions and and do the pricing and sort of maybe even check out somebody who's you know say can i listen to a reel like i'm doing a, a girl super talented young girl um and i need to send her actually another fabulous young actor girl justine huxley um, and Miranda Park, and I need to send um, their demos to this girl so she can kind of hear. So you want to ask for referrals. Can I hear some demos that you've done? Things like that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you guys were taking notes because now you have all the tools necessary to become the next Lori Allen. But with <laughs> that said, ladies and gentlemen, I know plenty of you have already asked questions and comments for Lori Allen, either in the live chat or you've messaged VisionCon the page. Yes, let's get to them. I'm sorry so, if I talk too long. Can oh, no, you're time? fine. You can do either, and this is your last chance to do so, because ladies and gentlemen, we're in the plug zone. Lori yeah. Allen. Just keep watching SpongeBob. We're on to our 20th, 21st year, still recording, and then the pre-SpongeBob, which is Camp Coral, which is so exciting, so look that up. I get to be a baby. I am not, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say that, but it's so <laughs> awesome to be like, <laughs> so, um, there's that, and then I have this wonderful pilot out that's about, a, you know, a woman of a certain age, you know, um, dealing with this crazy town in, in the crazy land of voiceover. So you can watch the pilot that Fia and I wrote called Do the Voice. There's some amazing voice actors in it. Phil Lamar, Mindy Sterling, John Kassir. Um, I know I'm missing someone, so please forgive me. I'm thinking in the cast. Mo Gaffney's in it. Just Paul Iacono. Um, Lee Hudson, there's amazing people in it. Monica Allison, my dear friend, and her daughter, Mila. So there's just, it's a, it's a hysterical show. It's like 13 minutes long, so you can go to do, do the, excuse me, do the voice.com and, and have a good time laughing at me <laughs> in this crazy business of ours. Well, all those links. Drew, Drew is in it. Drew plays my agent, Jeff Danis. He's so freaking funny. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so that's really what I got to plug for now. And Disney Plus, yay, keep watching. So for some residuals, so I can pay my mortgage. Yeah. And all of those links, plus social media and websites, are all in the live chat right now, guys. Or if you're watching, yeah, or if you're watching on YouTube, you're going to be down in the description below. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're out of the plug zone, and in the final segment, viewers' comments and questions. So, I'm going yeah. to bring up the list of questions, both in the messenger and in the live chat. Thankfully, I want to look it up too. I was like, I'm doing the live. I can see what people. Oh yes, Fia says. Uh, I just asked her what rescue should I promote live right now. Uh, WSOS, um, 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 which is for the elephants. Tell me a quick one line uh, and social media. Um, great, so I'll get back to that in a minute. All right. It's Wildlife SOS. Sorry, it's Wildlife SOS. Quick brain fart. And they rescue Indian animals that have been chained up and tortured. And, you know, I never knew not to ride an elephant, that they're being tortured. You know, same with the circus. In order to do the tricks that they're doing or to go swim with dolphins that are also not getting fed and, you know, and trying to escape their enclosures and stuff. It's like, leave the animals in the wild where they belong. I mean, you can ask my dear colleague and dear friend Tara Strong, who's also a vegan animal activist, and I just love her. And we're very much on the same page about that. And um, Theo works with Vet Paws, a great repurposing our veterans and um, and things like that. But Wildlife SOS does amazing things for 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 elephants that I think would be great. Oh, and Peace for Animals. My friend Katie is Peace for Animals, and she has an amazing. If you want to keep up, she has something called World Animal News, and you can just see like kind of what's going on with you know factory farming animals which is which is why i love mercy for animals you can just see how we just really as humans do really shitty things to them before we eat them um and the the the, the and then katie has her organization peace for animals but she has world animal news so there's a bunch of fun things and like i said jane velez mitchell uh, mitchell badass jane unchained Bam! She is out of control um, more energy than i do on any given day times ten thousand. Well, all those links will be in the description below, guys, on YouTube. Thank you so much. But Thank you for doing that. Of course. Of course. We all got to work together to make this world a better place. And speaking of, well, really nothing that we just said, we're going back now into viewers' yes. comments and questions. Yes, yes. Thanks, guys, for putting up with me. Yay. Let's do that. So Aaron wrote in and wanted to know, and also I wanted to say before we began, all of these questions have been skillfully cultivated by my co-worker at VisionCon, Marissa Pence. Thank you so much, honey. Thank you're you, Marissa. Woo, 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 woo. As always, you're the wind beneath my sails, Marissa. Aaron wrote in and wanted to know, in honor of Disneyland's birthday today, what's your favorite memory? 
Oh my goodness. Um, doing the Pixar stuff is, is, is incredible. So I'm so happy to be a part of the Disney Pixar family and, um, just the so to do Bonnie's mom in both Toy, Toy Story three and Toy Story four and to work with a bunch of amazing men and women like you know Lorraine Newman and Mindy Sterling and just like I'm Sherry Lynn and all these amazing people um, that I'm forgetting and Carlos Alas Rocky and a bunch of fantastic people where we do a lot of the voices and stuff and um, you know Bonnie's mom has been just so sweet as the story continues to evolve in Toy Story right. So as it moves on into Toy Story 4, one of the best moments I had, and thank you for that question, I love it, was just the, you know, I don't get geeked out very often. It takes a lot to geek me out, you know? And I remember being like, that's Keanu Reeves at the Toy Story 4 premiere. <laughs> and, you know, I walked up to him because he's an amazing human being. He's just like, he's, he'll just ride somebody home if there's like a, and not in a creepy way, but like if they've just had a flat tire, like he gives all his money to charities and he's just a very cool, you know, introverted dude. And I just said, hi, you probably don't know me. I played, you know, Bonnie's mom in the film and your role is hysterical as um, as the motorcycle guy, Duke, I'm forgetting his name, Duke Kaboom. Yeah. And I said, it's just lovely to meet you. Thank you for what you do for people. And I think he was like, mm, OK, but he was very nice. And then Tom Hanks, meeting Tom Hanks was like, he's like, it's, he's like, I just love your voice. I love that warmth that comes to how are you doing? And I was like, I'm really good. You know, so again, I don't get geeked out easily, but being a part of the Pixar family is, is, is such an honor. I, I don't even have words for how I feel about that. Oh, that is so sweet to hear. Well, Marissa actually wanted to ask a question. She said, yes, do you teach beginners or do you work with people who are more advanced in your private lessons? And then she also wanted to know, kind of as a, an addendum to that question, how is it to be a female working in the voice acting industry? So I send a lot of the beginning folks to my dear friend Susan Palio at VoiceTracksWest.com. In fact, she's just starting up a, a commercial class. I, I, I am though, I, I mean, I coach mostly commercial and animation. So I'm, I'm happy to, to, you know, reach out if you want to reach out to me to talk about, you know, sort of the state of where things are to do privates. I really believe being in a class situation and then supplementing with a privates. Some people just coach with me and get a set of three or six. You can find that on my website under coaching. Um, I, I, as I said, I just, I really love it. And I think it's important to wherever you're at, there's room for everybody at the table, especially with e-learning and audiobooks and games, you know, interactive games. There's just more and more voiceover stuff and it's a great way to get into the union. Um, so I can't stress that enough. And then, um, and then what did you ask Marissa? What's it like to be a woman in the voiceover industry? I think that was it. Yes. Yeah. So that's an interest. That's a great question. You know, times they are a change in, I mean, for on camera as well for me and and all other females working in the business and directors and um, producers. It's really wonderful to um, I've read on a couple of scripts lately where, you know, it's obviously it's so important right now during this time, which is a whole other topic, really. But to be, you know, where there's shows that are about kids who are trans and kids who are gay and kids who are somewhere in between and they don't identify and whatnot. And so it's 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 really important to um, have strong female voices and just amazing producers on shows that, you know, like Rebecca Sugar is like a huge idol of mine, you know, for Steven Universe because she just encompasses everything that, you know, I want to be when I grow up. So it's a good time to be, it's a good time to be, um, a lady in the in the VO world right now. Good. Um, we did have a bunch of people, including uh, Kelly Bender, who wanted to wish you a happy birthday tomorrow. Thank you, Kelly. I love you, Kelly. She's such a great. She started a whole Bring Diane back. It was so adorable on oh. Twitter, and she's done some beautiful. I don't have it in front of me. I'm so sorry, Kelly. Beautiful portraits of of my dogs, which is the sweetest thing. So thank you, Kelly. You're the best. <laughs> well, I did want to read a couple more questions that were actually messaged to VisionCon, kind of to make it fair, guys. Yeah. So the first I want to do is Ashley wrote in and wanted to know kind of throughout the years, what were some of the characters that meant the most to you? Uh, you know, either portraying in acting or, you know, voice acting, you know, any of them that stuck with you through the years. One of the ones is very funny. It was Hey Arnold, where I played this very waspy mom. It was like, darling, you look absolutely hideous in those glasses. Oh my God. <laughs> so that was a very fun thing. And to be, you know, you sort of look back at your career. I was like, I was on Animaniacs or I did, you know, Mandy and Billy. Like, that's crazy. I don't even remember what I did on that show. I just remember um, Quentin Flynn, who I adore, and his brother, Bart Flynn, who I adore, who, who's back in Ohio, who still works quite a bit. He just had to play this crazy farty 
supporting character that was hysterical. But to play Sue Richards, the invisible woman, and to meet Stan Lee was like, you know, flame on, you know, it's hard to not talk like Sue Richards, like, get down from there. I remember Quentin and I driving around in the car once, because the, I guess the, the director had changed in, our, in the next season that we were on. And he was like, I want you guys to listen to this. And so a dry track of a recording of a show where you're doing effort noises just sounds like you're constipated or having sex. Like, Ugh, ah, mm, <laughs> oh, oh, ee, ah, you know, so um, I learned a lot on that show. Um, and then, you know, at the time when Family Guy was first happening, like I said, I didn't, I didn't recognize um, the script when I read it for Family Guy because it was so different. It was about a talking dog, but it was wildly different. And so when I went into Fox to test for Lois, I was like, Seth, you know, because I met him right when he got out of school to do his Larry and Steve uh, pilot at Hanna-Barbera that he won this great thing to have a pilot made. And uh, and so that was really fun. So that's great. And, you know, getting killed off on that show was certainly a bummer, but Seth could not be more of a brilliant genius, um, wonderful, kind, funny person who has the loveliest folks. I think his his mom has passed away, but he's a big animal person and he's super successful. And his sister, Rachel, I adore. And so the whole family is stupid, talented and lovely. So. Well, one final question. we got time for one more question. So I'm going to go to Dominic who wanted to know Hi, how, Dominic. how effective was your commercial work into your, you know, your later kind of entertainment yeah. work. So kind of super. how, yeah, super important because you learn to tell a story. So even if it's like, you know, introducing the all new Camry hybrid or Tonight at Five or L'Oreal Mascara Lush Lashes or whatever it is, or if it's more like, you know, pajama bottoms on sale at Old Navy through, you know, Christmas, you know, through January 3rd or whatever, you learn to literally find your voice, like find what you sound like, because now even the more real read, like I said, has crept into some animation. They're still crazy over the top characters, which I prefer and I love. But um, like the boss and Diane are very real sounding people, right? So um, to find your voice commercially um, and also a, an agent can really get to hear what you sound like. And so, you know, this many people want to be actors. This is how many people are. This many people want to be in voiceover. And this many people are. This is how many people want to do animation. But there, like I said, there's room for everybody as long as you've got some kick-ass training and perseverance like nobody's business. And um, really the way in the door is through is through having a really good, well-produced commercial reel. And I hate it when people are like, oh, my friend can just edit that together. You have one chance to make a first impression. Like you wouldn't go to an orthodontist if you broke your ankle, right? Go to someone who does, produces demos. Um, like myself and Susan or Chuck Duran, Mary Lynn Wisner, or Tim Friedlander. Those are just some off the top of my head real quick that I can think of. Um, so they're amazing you know so so you want your 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 studying and your demo to be like kick-ass well ladies and gentlemen that's all the time we got today so ladies and gentlemen this has been episode 17 of vision con live now before we hop up and i go clean up that water i spilled when i threw that box Lori yeah. allen <laughs> is there anything you want to leave us out on I don't think so. I just feel so bad because we probably didn't get time for questions, enough questions, because I rambled on, as Ow. usual, per oh. usual. Yeah, plenty of I just want to say one thing to everybody during this time. Um, it's a very scary time right now, and it's a very weird time. I've had so many crying jags and like stuff where I've thrown across the room because it's a really stressful time. So anything that you're, anything and everything that you're feeling, don't be afraid to reach out to get help. Check on your family members. Check on your friends. When you're having a shit day, check on somebody else. Make sure they're okay. Make sure you're exercising. Make sure you're, even though you're zoomed out, all of us are like, I can't look at another device. You know, get in therapy if you need to right now. It's an important time for your mental, physical, uh, spiritual, like sanity. Because, you know, and when people are like, you know, but it's my freedom to just not wear a mask. No, actually it's not because like I have really bad asthma. So I wear a mask for you and you wear a mask for me. And it's not really a political thing or it's a freedom thing. The disease doesn't care. If, if it's me or you or my best friend or or whoever. So it's just a smart thing to really, um, you know, wear a mask and wash your hands and not really sort of have a little debate about that. It's really not debatable, it's science. So I just encourage everybody to, to believe in science again. And it comes from our leadership down. And also to vote, to get ready to vote. You can follow Nerds Vote, fabulous colleagues of mine, JP and um, Courtney Taylor and JB Carlack to, to follow Nerds Vote. Um, and vote, vote, vote this November. So that's what I would tell people is to let's take back control of our, you know, our, our, our crazy sort of um, administration that's going on for me. Sorry if I'm offending anyone, but I just think it's important to vote and be a part of your 
world. Literally could not have said it better myself. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode 17 of VisionCon Live. Make sure to tune in next Monday, July 20th at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time for my interview with Lucy Christian, Nami from One Piece, Raraka from My Hero Academia, and Honey from Orin High Host Club, just to name a few. But until <laughs> next time, I, of course, am your host, Zach Wilson. But much more importantly, this has been my special guest, Lori Allen. You guys take care, Thank stay you. safe, and always remember, guys. Take care. Life's better when you've got friends to share it with.